welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Pierre Valencia. If you recognise my voice or the jingle playing in the background, you may be expecting a conversation about art and politics to follow. And you would be right. This time, however, I'll attempt to cover more art, more politics and more history than ever before. This is thanks to a new book, Sociopolitical Aesthetics, Art Crisis and Neoliberalism, by Kim Chanley, that situates the political art practices of today in the history of the avant-garde and in developments of the conceptual art movement of the 1970s. We'll discuss terms like social turn, relational aesthetics, social practice, institutional critique, and indeed, crisis. Kim Charnley is an art historian and theorist at the Open University. I'm very happy that he joins me now. Kim, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Well, it's great to have you. Kim, I was interested in your book in particular because of the historical take that it brings with it. Having read some of your earlier work and having known your research a little bit, I always imagined you as a child of the 70s. This is not a comment on your age necessarily, but I'm <laughs> under the impression that the 1970s have meant quite a lot for you in your research trajectory and indeed in what comes to inform your thinking in this particular book. So maybe you could, I could ask you what it is about this particular time that has been so important to you. Yes, absolutely. And I am indeed a child of the 1970s, but I don't know whether that was what got me into it historically, but um, as a historical period. But to give you a kind of sense of that, I think that where I started from in my research was to think about conceptual art uh, of the 1970s and to think about how it became politicized what happened when it became politicized now that's a very Mm wide-ranging tale Um, and i was focusing most of all on a group called art and language in particular art and language in new york and a publication called the fox that's kind of quite storied because it uh, was very conflictual, but it was also quite theoretically rich. At the tail end of conceptual art, trying to think about how Mm -hmm. conceptual art might be thought to be political. And that was one of the things that really got me interested to start with. Um, From there, I was also interested in collectives. I also did some research on collectives of the 1980s, and in particular one called Group Material. I was also interested in institutional critique, which is a term that kind of crops up very widely Mm -hmm. in discussions of contemporary art. And I kind of was interested in, well, how, how did it get to have such wide circulation and and what was going on you know in the way that people were thinking about the political states involved in that so it it kind of all circles around those sorts of issues and has a couple of different lines of inquiry that they, they play into this book too both about politicized art criticism and 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 how that comes to use this sort of terminology it does and the sort of frame of reference but also about questions to do with collectives and what stakes there are involved in that in art. Well thank you I think we're beginning to have a bit of an idea of a methodological toolkit emerging and I think we'll also be jumping over many of the keywords that you brought up just now. Mm -hmm. So Kim I want to make a proposal um, and for that I'd like to make it clear to listeners that Your book, as any serious work of art history, follows a certain trajectory. You start in the 1920s talking about the historical avant-garde and you develop your ideas about collectivity, neoliberalism and institutions and and politicised art from the 1970s to the present time. But what I want to propose, if that's not too perverse, is that we try to take and construct your argument backwards. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, as much as your book takes us all the way to about 2019 and post Brexit situation in Britain, I wonder whether we could take that as a starting point and work mm-hmm. backwards to construct the history and theory of politicized artistic movements. Mm-hmm. Well, if that works, I'd like us to jump into the phenomenon that is Chunky Mark, Mark McGowan, mm-hmm. artist, political commentator, in scare quotes, social media personality. If you could try to unravel him a little bit for us, that would be fantastic. 
Yeah, so Chunky Mark, or, or also known as Artist Taxi Driver, is a social media personality whose persona is that he is a taxi driver who tends to basically post almost every day a kind of rant about uh, politics, or he certainly did for, for a while. That was kind of one of the things he became known for doing. Now, in the UK, uh, taxi drivers are that this is almost like kind of cliche that taxi drivers are kind of right wing really and they were kind of you know rant about that but he isn't he's clearly situated somewhere on the left and he's also done some other things off the back of that which is selling artworks he sells a lot of artworks which is of course a lot of people do online and he does sort of news commentaries as well so kind of like his own kind of little news commentary where he'll talk about the headlines of the day and he's still doing it um it tends to change you know there's different kind of moments and phases in the way he's kind of doing about it doing it but it's kind of a very long running project for him there's a question about whether it is art in the sense that I don't know if we're going to get into this perhaps in our in our discussion, but I'll, I'll just quickly say that he did go to art school. He was known as a performance artist before he started doing this, but I don't know that many of his followers would necessarily need to know that or, you know, it would necessarily mean that much to them. Well, I think there's a way of finding out. I'm going to drop in the audio now from a remix of one of Chunky Mark's iconic rants about the magic money tree. This is a very iconic moment in recent British politics. But let's just play it and see see how it goes down with our audience. Pay increase. We will be spending half a trillion pounds on the National Health Service. But nurses so get paid less and less. My wage slips from 2009 reflect exactly what I'm earning today. But there isn't a magic money tree that we can shake that suddenly provides for everything that people want. It was like magic. How did they, you know, I love it when the Tories say, your community centre, get shut down. Your library, shut down. Your fire station, shut down. Your police station, shut down. Tory vulture capitalists, property speculators, get the key. The magic money tree. And it's shut down. You know, I love it when the Tories say, where are you going to find the money? Like they don't know. <laughs> you got it all, you greedy bastards. You know exactly where it is. Then they go on about, magic money tree <laughs> it's in the cayman islands the bahamas the british virgin islands panama Panama fucking mark <laughs> that's where the magic money tree and yeah the tories have all the money and everyone knows it you know your community center shut down your library shut down your fire station shut down your police station shut down tory vulture capitalists property speculators well, there's quite a lot going on there. We heard the Prime Minister Theresa May at the beginning, and of course the rant, um, the complaint is by artist taxi driver Chunky Mark himself, but also this particular clip, because it made the rounds so much, appears to have been mixed in by a grime artist whose name I hope you'll be able to remind me I think it was JME uh, well, I don't know if he remixed I don't think he remixed it someone online remixed it with the JME track ah well so there's even even an extra layer of complications here but I think this is a fantastic example to start our analysis with because we arrive at a moment in which Mark McGowan artist taxi driver plays into a genre of kind of political commentary, political panditry that is already ever-present online, on social media. So I wonder what I could ask you to talk a little bit about the aesthetic aspect of what it is that's happening here, given the kind of political conventions and the space within which this work operates. Well, I think that where I was trying to come into this, or why I chose that, was because it resonated for me with some uh, writings by Jacques Rancière about uh, about aesthetics, and and Jacques Rancière is a writer whose work is widely discussed in relationship to mm-hmm. the socio, you know, the social turn, but. 
kind of selectively discussed as well because his work he himself as is now kind of really widely known was not all that keen mm. on the kind of uh, work that was being done around um relational aesthetics or different versions of post relational aesthetics and and his his writing tends to provide a really interesting commentary however on questions to do with the word and the way the word kind of operates within aesthetics and the way the word can create visibility as he puts it, you know, as well as kind of, you know, operate outside of visibility, because of course, you know, you, you know, it's an, it's received hourly or textually, you know, in different kinds of ways. And in this case, it seemed to me that this sort of magic money tree kind of little meme, I mean, that would have been a piece of language that would have been poured over quite, I'm sure, carefully by those designing the speech for Theresa May Cave in which she first delivered that line. I mean, it's intended and designed to be quite easily circulatable, to kind of resonate with people in a particular way and to suggest all sorts of kind of corollary ideas like, you know, at that time, this was about a pushback against um, the critique of austerity, which now weirdly has kind of gone right out of the window. You know, mm -hmm. kind of the whole political kind of framework within the UK has changed enormously in the sense yeah. that there really isn't a political party defending austerity as there once had was, as there was at that time in 2017. Yeah. Um, and so this seemed like a great example of the way that someone could kind of take hold of um, one of these sort of phrases and to really force its sense to be perceived differently and to contest it, you know, mm -hmm. that was what it, it effectively just is that he's kind of contesting that, but he's doing it in, in a particular kind of way. Now, the videos that he does are, are not aesthetically interesting in the sense that they're visually interesting, anything but really, I mean, they're kind of just, as you will have seen, a dash cam that kind of, um, shows him sitting in a car usually he's got sunglasses on but the way he kind of engages with language is kind of interesting there's a sense that this is extemporary engagement with language mm -hmm. you know a kind of like a rant you know he's trying to kind of pull out or struggle with the way that certain forms of kind of linguistic formulations do so seem to just impose a kind of frame of reference really really quickly you sort of feel persuaded by and and that seems to me one of the things that he was doing. He was kind of working through that, yeah, the kind of effort that it takes to resist the way that language can kind of set parameters to the way that debates can be undertaken and to shape subsequent options that are available to critique a set of policies in this case. Well, Artist Taxi Driver certainly rehearses this kind of critique to a certain degree of perfection. I recommend that listeners um, do check out at Chunky Mark on Twitter. As a little aside, when I when I looked him up, having read your book, I discovered that for some bizarre reason, he follows me. So I'll, ah. hopefully at some point I shall become a subject of one of his rants. But the reason I wanted us to look at this particular um, example that you bring up in the book right at the beginning is that I think it marks a very interesting point of division between the kind of political practices that we are cultured to that that are rooted in the 1970s if not not even earlier and a kind of political sloganeering that has become at least to my mind much more commonplace in the twitter sphere and in social media so i wonder whether there's an example to make that distinction a little bit Further, we could look at another artist that you bring up, and that is Tim Etchells, artist, writer, and an artist who is quite well known, I guess, for working with the word, working with the slogan, usually quite repetitious, usually made out and rendered in neon light. And the particular work to which you refer in the chapter is a rallying cry, which says, let's make a revolution seven times in seven different colored neon lights. And this work was present. This work was installed on a side of a civic building in England. And I'm going to put a link to this work in the episode notes. The first thing I would say is, of course, the fascinating thing about language is it doesn't stay in place. So, you know, that it's very difficult 
perhaps to differentiate between what a slogan that might be artistic and one that is say political in the longer term mm. because you know the same language can take on a different role at different times and perhaps that's my kind of or that kind of puzzle is lying behind some of these reflections the tim Mitchell's piece is of course and i think that the way i read it anyway is that it's intentionally generic you know mm. so that in terms of the way that he proposes this idea of let's make a revolution i mean there's a subtlety to the way tim Mitchell's uses these sort of language uses language mm -hmm. and he does it in different ways but but this is particularly it seems to me articulating the sense in which revolution is in some ways quite a banal idea yeah. in that you find it everywhere and you know it's it's taken up uh, all the way across mass culture and perhaps that's part of the way that kind of our current power structures or liberal democratic kind of uh, public sphere reassures itself that mm. revolution is is no longer a uh, uh, a real prospect. So it seemed on one level that's what his work is doing. I happen to see it, and this is by chance really, it just mm -hmm. I happen to see it at, at the same time uh, as the build up toward the Brexit vote of 2016. So I saw it a little bit before that. And in retrospect, that seemed to me to be quite interesting or something to reflect on anyway, because I was really trying to kind of think about how through that period of time, the ex one's experience of language seemed to change quite a mm -hmm. lot. Um, it certainly seemed that in the retrospective commentary on Brexit, there's a lot of attention to the role that slogans might have had. The famous one being take back control, which is still often talked about. And it didn't seem to me that that was the case beforehand, you know, that, that really slogans were just bits of language that might have historical mm -hmm. interest, but, you know, not really a political power that they seem to have in the yeah. wake of in the wake of Brexit. So I suppose what I'm reflecting on in, in, in the work that Tim Etchells does is just those sorts of issues which are to do with, or they're, they're kind of adjacent to, I think, his own reflections on language and the way that kind of language operates in different ways politically so that you know to be political language isn't just to shout a slogan at somebody but is to kind of is to try and kind of interrogate some of the slippage or some of the kind of ways that language is uh, that, that the fact that language doesn't stay in place is also one of its kind of political implications and, and that's a Ranciarian point too yeah. I mean I think that's what Ranciere often talks about in relation to his, his discussions around language. So another thing that I think is interesting at, at this point, as we work our way back this trajectory of the avant-garde to relational aesthetics, to social practice, to maybe the society that we're in of artistic activism and the sloganeering, is to consider a little bit the role of artistic practices, political artistic practices in affecting some degree of change. But there's a degree of expectation or rather there's a degree of kind of declaration of social utility in a lot of contemporary art practices particularly in the last five maybe ten years depending mm -hmm. on which geography one looks so what really interests me as a comparison between your takes on mark mcgowan with his you know quite a significant following for you know for twit we could argue that twitter produces absolutely nothing for anyone but he does have hundred thousand followers yeah. who do engage. There are people whose politics is formed by the repetition of, of the critique of the magic money tree and many other slogans and rants like this. So I wonder if there's a way to look at the different types of utility that go beyond just the reflection on the medium, reflection on the slogan, between someone like Tim Etchells and someone like Mark McGowan, where the political agency of those, those slogans might be different simply depending on the infrastructure through which they they reproduce. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good point, of course. And um, I think that this is a very important, perhaps, to lay out that the book is a discussion that may not be entirely concluded about the way that uh, 
that we should view this question of utility in relation yeah. to uh, these social, this tendency for more practices to make reference to the social. Not all practices that do make reference to the social claim to have utility. Some mm -hmm. do and, and some don't. So by utility, you know, was saying an effect. And usually the claim is that it's a kind of beneficial effect of some kind, yeah. you know. And, and of course, it's extremely hard to demonstrate this in any real sense. And perhaps I pick up from what you were saying there, Pierre, you know, there's a kind of critique of this claim to utility that is now quite well known. And it's also has, it's justified in a lot, of, a lot of cases, which is to say that, you know, well, why do people always claim they've got kind of, there's their social utility? They can't really demonstrate it. And, you know, perhaps this is in some degree either, you know, kind of self-serving in an institutional sense, mm. you know, a kind of, you know, a way of kind of ensuring that they can get funding or it's, you know, otherwise a way of, of contributing to a kind of neutralization of, 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 of more mm. radical political political aims that art might have. And, you know, I, I think that that can be persuasive, but I don't want to, I don't want to fall on that side of the line entirely because mm. I, I think that utility is sort of interesting you know i kind of keep coming back to it because even if it it seems to get trapped in some of these kinds of claims i still think coming back to it it's a point of tension maybe it's a limit mm. of what arts politics is well let's bravely tackle that limit and move not necessarily all that far back in time to the era of social practice which i think is a term that most would associate with the kind of institutional political practices that we are surrounded by now. Right, so social practice art tends to make some claim towards utility. And I talk about this, this development partly as a type of critical, a development within criticism. You know, that this term started to get used more widely around, say, 2010 maybe mm -hmm. you know it, it it was used kind of partly retrospectively as often is the case when critical frameworks emerge they kind of sort of invent themselves a little history at the same time yeah. and you get overlapping critical terms for that reason in and around social political aesthetics and there's lots of them you know that you can use I, I look at it partly in relation to some of Tonya Bruguera's work, Tonya Bruguera, who, who, who actually makes lots of different types of work, but some of her work has kind of fallen in, you know, as can be is legible through this term, social practice. And what I'm trying to do is to engage some of those critiques that suggest that this work is sort of in sort of shallow complicity with kind of institutional mm. frameworks, with a, a certain kind of political coziness with the yeah. regime of the state and i think that that critique has justification to some degree but not always and, and what i'm trying to do in the reading of tonya Bruguera's work that i propose is to sort of try and tease out the, the kind of idea of community that is proposed in some social practice you know it tends to be an idea that it's possible to in the context of an artwork, perhaps to generate some more harmonious kind of um, social relationships. Um, I'm really making this much more simple than it usually, simply put, than it usually is, you know, and there's lots of different kind of qualifications around that, but there is a, that is pretty common, you know, that people mm -hmm. kind of talk in those terms, more or less. And I think that that is a claim that is not well founded. You know, if you look at kind of the way that arts inter intervene, these kind of things intervene, then, you know, it's like, well, the nature of our social reality is such, let's say, under under capitalist society, it's really discordant. You know, it's really problematic to kind of think that art will be able to intervene in that way. I'm not saying it never has any usefulness and, and, and in, a, in a limited sense or for those people who are involved in it, it can do. But the claims are usually much, much bigger than that. And, and those bigger claims are, are, are problematic. However, there's still something interesting about these works that try and kind of place possibility of a harmonious social artwork, you know, in contexts that are fraught 
and the the artists themselves to see doing is kind of sometimes making clear what the contradictions are they're asking questions they themselves can't solve basically <laughs> you know to to appropriate a, a kind of critique that, that term actually comes from um critic ben davis and and i think he means that as a criticism you know that he's trying to say they're not effectual these kinds of uh, works but i think that you can kind of use that same point and just say well that's true but you know that's part of what's interesting about the work it's an intervention that you know it has an institutional form very often you know the artists are trying to do something helpful in a conflicted situation and you know i i expect that they do to some extent but they are not able in that situation to meet the horizon of their work you know with reality mm. the horizon of the work is you know that, that it's possible for art to kind of create some kind of m more harmonious social situation but that's not ever going to happen but the gap between that and the actual reality is itself something that's activated mm. potentially by the work if we read it in in that way and i suppose that's that's one of the kind of arguments that i'm trying to unfold uh, one of the ways I'm trying to, to to engage with some of the debates around social practice. So maybe I can ask you to look at a couple of examples. And one of the great strengths of the book is that you go in quite a lot of depth into analysing individual works, sometimes work that I wouldn't have in my experience of these social and, and movements that, that we're talking about, I would not have picked as kind of prime example. So I really no, value indeed. that. So I wonder whether it, maybe we could look at Tanya Bruguera, who, who you've already referred to, associated with the Arte Util movement, the mm -hmm. deeper, the go-to artist who represents art's social usefulness. Mm -hmm. And you look at her 2018 commission for the Turbine Hall at State Modern, entitled, yeah. I believe, 10 yeah. Maybe, Maybe you remember what that stands for. But that, just to, to give our listeners a little picture, um, essentially covered the massive, massive ramp of the turbine hole with uh, heat-sensitive material that appears black until it's activated by mm -hmm. the human body, by heat, at which point it reveals a fragment of a portrait of a man underneath, which I believe probably was never actually revealed in its entirety because it would require the cooperation of quite a few people. Yeah. And if I recall, there was also a room off, off to the side of this in which um, some kind of chemical that had the same effect as, say, uh, chopping onions would do, as in it yeah. inspired tears in the audience. So in the chapter Social Practice, I tend to frame the discussion around two case studies between Tanya Bruguera, who is a globally known artist, who's, who's a proponent of what she calls art utile. And uh, I focus on a uh, uh, Tate Turbine Hall commission that she did, which was focused on questions to do with um, the migrant crisis, so-called migrant crisis of, uh, which has been especially focused in, in this work on the borders of Europe, Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean. But I also look at a work by uh, perhaps lesser known, you know, kind of exponent of social practice, although he, he wouldn't, he doesn't like the term, uh, a man called uh, Mark Storer, who, whose background, I think, is in kind of theatre, uh, mm -hmm. experimental theatre, but he now operates as an artist too in a work called Bar Barbaric, have you any poll, which is a, a really interesting regional kind of arts commission that was commissioned by Heart of Glass, which is a, a commissioning body that works particularly in St. Helens City in the Northwest. Okay, and the reason I compare them is, first of all, it sort of struck me that it's interesting. First of all, that you've got kind of social practice that are at the kind of apex of visibility of, of contemporary art mm -hmm. in the work of Catania Bruguera. But also, it's, it's a kind of a type of practice that operates at a sort of different level within the art world, which is more regional, let's say, or kind of engaged yeah. with kind of arts council funded type work, although it's a large scale work and it's a commission that goes on for something like 12 years. And, and what I thought these works had in common is that they were both legible, as social practice in the sense that they were kind of pr 
proposing that art could do something ameliorative Mm -hmm. within a given kind of community space or social setting but also they were but they were operating at kind of different in different sort of regions of the art world let's say there were two examples that allowed me to sort of to make an argument that social practice does engage sometimes with kind of underlying tensions that exist in the social in our social experience the social world and you know and it can do that not only in the way that say was proposed by say Claire Bishop quite famously and who tended to advocate for really quite confrontational work in order to kind of expose the tensions these that kind of that were otherwise kind of smoothed over or covered over by more socially engaged type practices. Um, I propose the example because they seem to me somewhere falling between, between a kind of a caricatured version of socially engaged practice and, and a more antagonistic kind of space. Yeah. And they do so in the case of kind of Mark Storer's work. He, he's really interesting in the sense that he engaged with all the kind of civic bodies in St. Helens in his practice, in this work. There's a kind of a procession that, that he staged of school children proposing a, a kind of charter to the mayor of the town, which was in some way kind of interesting to me in relationship to Brexit, which kind of was taking place sort of around the same time. Mm-hmm. He also kind of says that the whole work is about the way that perhaps civilization is the worst form of barbarism. <laughs> you know, so there's a kind of a proposition there that is not what you quite expect from a kind of work of social practice. And indeed, he doesn't like the term social practice, but still, as I say, it's legible within that kind of framework. And that was a work that um, I particularly liked because one of the bodies that he kind of recruits in his kind of practice, it's a work that's supposed to last 12 years. Among the people he engages with are some men who are at the age that they started engaging with the work meant that by the end of it, they should be dead because of the <laughs> median age of death of, yeah. of, people, of men in St. Helens. Um, so conceptually, I'm like, well, that's, that's quite provocative. And I was interested to hear how, how those participants sort of found that. And apparently, according, I haven't interviewed them myself, but according to the artists, they found it quite funny, I think. You know, so there's kind of all these sorts of ways in which a, a reference to social antagonism can find its way into works that are seemingly about kind of creating an image of community as a coherent and sort of yeah. uh, harmonious whole. And I think that that's what that's what I liked about Mark, the Mark Storer example. In the case of Antonio Bruguera's work, it's a work that uh, in the title uh, that, that you, you mentioned, Pierre, which is a number. The number was a reference to the number of migrants who were dead or missing at a given point in time. But during the course of the display, the number increased. You know, yeah. and so that people that, have that, that, on that explains why I couldn't it. make sense of the of the annotations in the book because the numbers do change. Ah, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, well, that could just be a typographical problem <laughs> you found out with the book. Well, I'll give I'll give you credit for, for reading the situation far more closely than the no, no, I it. think it's more likely a typographical problem. But anyway, you know, I think Tanya Bagheria does something quite interesting there, which is about kind of interrogating this idea of what it might mean to be a kind of community working together to do something humanitarian. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's a kind of a sort of negativity. On the one hand, the work is all about local engagement, and she kind of changed the, the name of the Turbine Hall to the name of a local activist. Uh, she didn't do that at her decision, but she kind of engaged with local bodies in mm-hmm. order to kind of do that. So there's a kind of institutional engagement there. And yet the kind of technological thing that people encountered in the Turbine Hall is this sort of technologically interactive type yeah. installation that kind of has a potentially feel good aspect, but that kind of operates more conceptually than it does in reality, Mm -hmm. because no one's ever able to kind of coordinate themselves in such a way to reveal this picture. And even if they did reveal the picture, what would that mean? So I kind of like that (laughs) aspect of the work. And I think that, you know, Daniel Bruguera's work operates on a number of different levels and, and, and the way she talks about it. But I thought that there's a certain kind of negativity that's kind of 
that's brought mm-hmm. into it. And when I say negativity, I mean, you know, an acceptance of the fact that the social reality is a whole lot more complicated yeah. than it is likely to be resolved by an art practice uh, or an artistic intervention. Well, maybe this is a good moment to return to one of the key questions in the book, which is that of the role of the institution in uh, various forms of social artistic practice. So in the case of Tanya Bruguera's project here, we are, of course, framed by the outreach activities that an institution, a museum like Tate Modern, has at its disposal in the case of the work of Mark Storer, The commissioning programme, which you referred to, is part of a, I'd say, very top-down initiative by the Arts Council England to institute a notion of community through artistic practices. But these are just two examples in the long history of interventions and kind of tensions between the institution, the artist and the communities, which I think you valuably tackle in the book. I think that um, the institution, the art institution, is a central thread through the book, trying to think about what we might mean when we refer to art institutions. And this is kind of intriguing to me, uh, continually intriguing, because um, to refer back to the beginning of the book, it sort of starts really with the first chapter that talks about the term institutional critique and some early uses of that term that I kind of Mm -hmm. identified um, in the work of, uh, I didn't find them myself, I should say, they were kind of noted previously by other art historians, but I wrote about them perhaps more Mm -hmm. in more depth than they've been written about more uh, previously. And they gave me a little lever to kind of try and ask, well, what do we mean by institutional critique and why is it so ubiquitous, this term? so just to give some background, I think that um, the, the kind of standard definition of what institutional critique means is that it, it, it derives from a type of artistic practice that particularly kind of emerged in the 70s, but yeah, it's sort of like a strategy in the sense that it is still being used now, hmm. although it was often at first identified with a number of artists who, who were working in the 1970s, 60s and 70s. And it's a it's understood to be about reflecting critically on the conditions, the social conditions yeah. and institutional conditions under which an artwork is made. And in so doing, to try and kind of unpack the politics of art and put it on display. Whereas, you know, on the typical kind of circumstances, it might not be displayed. All this is kind of back of house sort of political kind of stuff, whether it's to do with the actual way that art is commissioned or the way the decisions go into kind of displaying it. But also, you know, ultimately what is its kind of ideological kind of role within a given sort of social formation. So this is the kind of background. So what struck me about this is that, okay, well, when we talk about institutions, we also kind of need to think about how institutions have changed Mm -hmm. since the 1970s. And they've changed fundamentally, our institutions Mm -hmm. have changed. And they've changed in a kind of dynamic relation to a changing social reality, which operates on many different levels. For example, just to kind of use a few of them, you know, there's a lot more people who go through art school now than they did in the mm-hmm. 1970s. There's a lot more art schools. There's a lot more. Yeah, that, that is my hope. That is one of my hobby horses. That the yeah. rise and rise <laughs> of the arts graduate is is something that bothers me on a daily basis. But <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, that's it. So that's one that you know. And we who are involved in the arts for whatever reasons and, and, you know, probably because we kind of love it for some reason, you know, like, you know, uh, what we have to do. And this is like a standard, almost like kind of a benchmark of kind of showing that you've read, you're familiar with contemporary art is that you have to have some way of talking about your own complicity in this kind of situation. (laughs) And, you know, that's in some ways a good thing. But in some ways, it's a kind of routine. You know, I I kind of digging around that question of complicity in relationship to the institution, partly, because I'm trying to sort of think, well, what does that mean? 
you know, and how do I orient myself towards that? And what, how does it resonate with wider political questions? Indeed, of course, on a wider political setting, it's it's been a big problem for Marxist, say, or other radical kind of positions more generally to kind of account for how they they actually exist within a, a, a capitalist world. So, so in a sense, the kind of problem of institutional critique has this similar form to kind of um, problems that are that exist in kind of wider political discourses around this question of complicity. Where I get to with it, it's a big question, and I don't know uh, that I come to a definitive answer. But one of the places that I get to is to try and kind of consider how some of these terms like social practice or relational aesthetics you know that have had different sorts of currency at different times um might seem to key into uh, a situation where in fact the art institution isn't becoming more dominant Mm -hmm. it's becoming more dispersed and fragmented now okay I might need to kind of qualify that and explain why that's even significant. But a lot of the institutional critique discourse tends to focus on complicity as, oh, you know, capitalism is this all-powerful social form, pervasive effects, and there's sort of a tragic sense in which art is kind of held within this. And our complicity is in a system that is kind of maintaining certain kind of class positions. Yeah. And, and, and it's, so I mean, Andrea Fraser, I presume, is, is, is so a very good example of that kind yeah. of mea culpa participation. Interestingly enough, um, subject to quite a lot of backlash and and also out of fashion within within a few months of her making those kind of observations. But such yeah, is the way sure. of life. Her mea culpa yeah. kind of got to a little bit of a dead end because, and yeah. then her subsequent writings are quite interesting because she's still trying to figure out how to square herself, her her relationship to, you know, to quite large institutions. Hmm. And then she starts to get into, in more recent work, she did the project, it was called 2016, which which was kind of looking at the actual political affiliations of of Hmm. board members across the big US institutions. You know, the sort of sociological kind of line she's kind of pursued. but, you know, it's a difficult one because it's a kind of brink- brinkmanship that she was kind of working yeah. with that, that is difficult to maintain, let's say that. And and I sort of felt that actually maybe that's not the dynamic that's at work, you know, hmm. quite. You know, that maybe what we see is something a bit more dispersed, a bit more kind of unstable, a bit more kind of oriented to the term crisis you know crisis is a difficult term because it can mean all sorts of different things and it's already embedded in art in art discourse in lots of different ways but I was sort of trying to think really I suppose in relation to what was happening when I was writing it which was that whole crazy period from 2016 but we haven't we're still in it uh, which sort of led me to sort of think well maybe we just need to find a different set of motifs in our in our political discourse around around uh, the relationship of political art to institutions. I'm sorry, I haven't really thought about this before, but as you were speaking now, I wonder if the art institution isn't like the most perfect exponent of a left-wing accelerationism, as in where it progresses, it changes itself, it fragments itself and morphs itself into these more flexible, adaptable forms to such an extent that eventually it can no longer really be thought in in those kind of formal terms. And of course, there are multiple meanings of institutions as much as mm. there are multiple meanings of crisis. I wonder if um, it wouldn't be a good, good idea to look at the example of the work of the artist and theorist Heta Steidel, who you devote a little bit of space to. But I think she has, in the last 10 years or so, has given rise to some interesting formulation of institutional critique, Mm. uh, particularly in works like November from 2004, which has historical arch, and also from, I believe, around 2013, the museum as a battleground. So maybe Mm. maybe I could ask you to use that as a way to get into some of the details of your observation and critique. Yeah, Hitushil, there's no doubt that she's, uh, in my mind, that she's a very important artist and theorist because of the way that her work has ranged across you know, quite a lot of different um, 
uh, questions to do with political aesthetics, obviously in and around uh, her kind of meditations on the nature of the image uh, in, you know, in contemporary political experience, but also she's written some really great stuff on institutional mm. critique, I think. And, and what I found that was striking about it was that it was trying to do that thing I mentioned before, trying to understand institutional critique in a sort of dynamic relationship to the changing form of the institution. Uh, and also in relation to questions around neoliberalism, but doing so in a way, especially in November, which is a really compelling film because it, it situates institutional critique in a quite different way than say Andrea Fraser does. And one of my little bugbears about institutional critique and, and perhaps one of the arguments that sits behind this is at a certain point, well, institutional critique really became formalized as, an, as, as a term in the 1980s through the yeah. work of, of Andrea Fraser and, and other, and other uh, figures who were sort of in and around the Whitney Independent Study Program and and, it, and sort of in dialogue with kind of October and, and the, some, some big kind of contemporary art critical institutions in, in the US. And although I, I think that Andrew Fraser is a really brilliant writer in, in some respects, um, I think that what was kind of notable about the way that institutional critique emerged at that time is that it sort of lost contact with the problems that had been really salient in the 1970s mm. around questions to do with class, which was just like, you know, a kind of a, a sense of kind of social active, social kind of mobilization and yeah. how art might sit respective to it. What seems to be the case, I would argue, in, in Fraser's work of that time um, is that it, she's talking about kind of the art world as an increasingly complex art world, mm -hmm. you know, because there's curators, there's more people involved, but, but with less sense of the contact to the outside. Now, that's not the case necessarily for all the figures who were kind of writing around that time. There was a sense in which institutional critique was also engaged with AIDS art activism, you know, and so mm -hmm. there was a dynamic kind of, you know, political aspect to it in yeah. the 80s. But certainly in Fraser's work, it's fair to say that this is the case. But in Hita Stirl's work, November, what you get is a kind of a sense of a reflection on the artwork through a reflection on political militancy and the fate of political militancy mm -hmm. in a world that has become, I wanted to say, increasingly complex, but that's a bit of a difficult claim to make. Perhaps in respect of art's image of it has become more global and perhaps mm -hmm. more textured in terms of its understanding of the complexity of some of these geopol mm. geopolitical questions. So in November, um, and also in the other film that we're discussing, The Museum of the Battlefield, one of the key figures in the film is a childhood friend of Hita Stills called Andrea Wolf, who actually featured in a kind of um, film that, that, that Hita Stirl was making, a kind of like low budget film that she was making as a student, um, but then subsequently became involved in militant politics and, and, and ultimately, you know, went to work with the PKK and was executed or killed by uh, Turkish security forces. Uh, this is alleged anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's an affecting film because it's about time. It's about the personal time of Hita Stirl's kind of reminiscence of a friend that she had as a, uh, you know, who appears both in her existence, uh, in, in her appearance as a young woman, but also in later kind of video footage, as well as a kind of icon or kind of martyr. It's, it's kind of tied up also, I think, as a kind of meta reflection on art's relationship to politics. And so it serves, I think, in the book to just try and complicate the way that we might periodize questions of the art institution, the critique of the art institution, and trying to kind of think about how these, what we might call works of institutional critique are always trying to engage with time in, in quite a complex sort of way. 
both in the sense in in, in the way in which kind of um, institu institutional critique is canonized now you know mm -hmm. it's kind of accepted kind of formula of kind of contemporary art but also trying to and I think he just drilled us as well, trying to kind of get beyond that and actually trying to think about what some kind of dynamic political states are for this kind of artwork now. Well, you mentioned here the difficulty of periodization, and I can see looking at the contents page of the book that we are rushing towards the 1970s. But before we get there, I want us to dwell a little bit about the link that is relational aesthetics. And you write about this in the book using um, the work of Felix Gonzalez Torres as your case study. And you do it, if I may say so, in an incredibly touching way. So I think my question is, what is it that makes the stacks of paper and piles of candies that most of our listeners will have encountered in a museum somewhere in the world? So what makes these works good exponents of political or indeed collective practices? I think it's fair point to make that Felix Gonzalez Torres's work is quite, you know, it's canonical. So it's sort of a very um, settled frame of reference yeah. in some respects for a certain period of participatory art that took, that, that emerged in the, in the 1990s. Um, and, you know, in some ways it sits in an odd way against, alongside some of the other examples that I use. But I really, really love Felix Gonzalez Torres's work, mm. first of all. And I felt that there was something that could be gained from revisiting it as a kind of way into the debates that Burio, what Burio hangs on it, really. Mm. And as a kind of, uh, because because Felix Gonzalez Torres's work plays a particularly important role, I think, in in the book Relational Aesthetics. Um, it's the only he's the only artist who gets a whole chapter or a whole essay within this very small kind of collection of essays. I see. I'm, I'm of a generation who witnessed relational aesthetics in the Tate Triennial and in practice, but I was spurred actually reading the book, and I'm I remain ah, grateful for that. Okay. I, en I entered well, the art world just as that was no longer needed. <laughs> so. It was no indeed, and quite probably quite quickly, it was no longer needed. Okay, but yeah. Sort of in terms of its critical. I mean, it's sort of reviled very mm. often, maybe not so much now because it's not seen as so relevant, but, you know, he's kind of embedded really in a certain yeah. kind of, uh, certain kind of history. Um, but at a certain time he, he sort of did because, you know, perhaps because he sort of half consciously, I think, proposed this as a counter discourse to that that had been developed by critics associated with October. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a kind of a critical discourse that seemed to, to, to operate in such a way as it allowed people to think about social immediacy in a different way in relation to artworks that were kind of disorganized or there wasn't very clear how one was supposed to approach them. So Felix Gonzalez Torres allows me to talk about that. And, and what it struck me was quite interesting about his work is that it played an important role in, in discourses around um, relational aesthetics, which are sort of like post-object kind of discourses, mm -hmm. typically. But his work does include objects. And, you know, they're, they're not very, like, important-looking objects, <laughs> but they are there. And, and you're, um, you're gesturing at something the size of a little little candy in a wrapper. Yes, that's right. A few, yeah, a few of to... which, a few of which I have on my on my bookshelf. Ah, brilliant! Yes, indeed. <laughs> For emergencies when the sugar when sugar becomes rationed. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, this is the thing. You know, with his work is that uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres' his work is now is now very very widely known, and also mm. everyone knows how to engage with it. An interesting fact is that it's, you know, in the process of kind of developing the work, I we had to do quite a lot of negotiation of the book, negotiation with the Felix Gonzalez Torres Foundation mm -hmm. to get images and get the rights to images. And they control that quite, you know, yeah. they're quite careful about that. Let's put it that way. And there's a sense in which I think that's because his work, a bit like Hans Hacker's, as I also talk about a little bit earlier, the whole nature of his work is that it, it's about the unfolding of a social kind of relationship yeah. that is not only about the immediate encounter with a given work, but about the work's reception as well. And Phoenix Gonzalez Torres also 
is interesting because he took quite a lot of time uh, included in the works are things like the kind of captions. The captions yep. have to be a certain way. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to use the image that I really wanted to use, which is an image which is of, of, of an early kind of example of someone engaging with one of his works. And you kind of get the sense people are laughing and kind of mm. don't really know how to how to encounter these kind of piles of sweets and kind of just picking them up or whatever they're doing. And in quite a lot of the critical reception of, of Felix Gonzalez stories, there's sort of discussion of this, of people doing things that they're not supposed to do. And indeed, this is also in Burrio's uh, account, you know, going and filling their pockets with sweets, you know, <laughs> kind of, or picking up loads of uh, of, uh, of posters and kind of stuffing them in the bin afterwards, this kind of thing. And I just kind of was interested in that, in the way that the kind of critical framing around this idea of social of what a social work is, a work of work which in, involves mm -hmm. sociality. I think perhaps to kind of cut to the chase, my, my central point is that in Burio's work, he kind of sort of imagines this kind of unity that is the encounter, yeah. that, that people are engaging with this work. And although we'll never see it, you know, and even if you were there, you wouldn't necessarily have perceived it it's it's important to the critical discourse about um about socially engaged works and even or in, i should say relational and post-relational works and even people who are really critical of burio including claire bishop and grant kester sort of do the same thing they kind yeah. of say there's kind of this originary kind of moment of the work you know which is recorded and that becomes important to the way that we talk about it you know that you know it has some kind of collective experiential basis. And I'm really not sure that these works do have that, you know, <laughs> or it's an open question whether yeah. they do. I think they pose really interesting epistemological questions because, or I find them interesting anyway, you know, because the way that we encounter them very often is through text and little documentary photographs or even just critical debates about them. And one of the ways, one of the effects that this seems to have is that you end up with quite a small canonical group of works that people yeah. tend to talk about. And, and, and it's difficult for, for other works to gain the traction to actually mm. enter the kind of critical canon because they need a bit of an argument about them, basically, to kind of get them sort of um, going, if you see what I mean. Yeah. I mean, this is a kind of a meta reflection on the way that this kind of critical debate has emerged. And and what I thought was quite interesting about about um, Felix Gonzalez's Torres's work is he sort of he didn't do that he didn't think that his work had an or originary moment he he rather set up some conditions within mm -hmm. which the work could exist and left people quite a lot of latitude within you know the kind of institutional kind of curatorial or ownership of the work as well as the people encountering the work to actually negotiate those conditions so that these works can exist at multiple times at the same time you know they can they they, they are different uh, each time they are kind of instituted and that to me is quite a different way of understanding what social experience is yeah. than imagining there's an originary moment that you know that everyone kind of got together and kind of experienced our work, right, in, in, in some kind of parallel sense. So that's that's where I'm getting at with it. The final point I would make about, which I haven't seen written about in relation to, to Felix Gonzalez Torres's work too much. Um, I don't claim to know everything that's been written about him though, because <laughs> it's a hell of a lot. So I may well have just missed it. But he wrote really interestingly about kind of capitalist crisis in the in, in the 1980s, and and so I kind mm. of, you know, he was writing about the savings and loan crisis that was a big deal back in the 80s and yeah. early 90s in in America, and it was in some ways a precursor to crisis of 2008. And so I was just trying to kind of think about the way that his works operate in relation to that into that kind of motif of crisis. Mm. He never made that link explicit himself, but I think it's there to be kind of reflected upon. Well, yes, the potential of the kind of curatorial critical complex to produce completely unfounded readings of canonical works and to maintain them is quite astounding.
But as we're jumping around the chronology of the work now, I wanted to take you straight to the cover and I'm going to ask you a potentially difficult or at least unfair question. Um, and I have asked it of other writers who have used the word aesthetics on the book cover. And in a sense, we have been addressing this question throughout this conversation, but I do want to, in a very, very plain way, ask you what it is that aesthetic means in this particular context. I mean, in the case of Felix Gonzalez Torres, we can think about what these works look like, that kind of very straightforward understanding of aesthetics. But I have a feeling that we really have to go way beyond that to make this term productive. Right, yeah, it's one of those terms. And, and I think my approach to aesthetics came via reading Ranciere. And Ranciere makes the point that no one's ever been happy with the term aesthetics. Even in Hegel's lectures on aesthetics back in mm. the early 19th century, he observes that it's a bit of an unsatisfactory term, but he's going to carry on using it because, you know, for want of something better. And it tends to drift around in terms of its meaning from, to begin with, a way of thinking about sensory experience more generally, including our experience of nature, to later, and probably kind of um, Hegel will be a kind of a key, a key uh, bridging point here, to being more confined to discussion about art. The, the thing that Ranciere does that's helpful is that, and I think that this is perhaps why he, his work, you know, kind of played into the social turn a lot, is is that it's not just about visual matters for, for Ranciere, because the aesthetic, he, he, he talks about a regime of visibility sometimes, mm -hmm. but what he means by that is partly something that's to do with language and the way that language makes it possible for us to see certain sorts of things and to kind of encounter things a certain sort of way. So always in his work, I would say that there's a sense in which a words have a relationship to visual questions. And, you know, there's a kind of interesting kind of subtle play that he, he, he has around those sorts of kind of issues. So in my approach there, then, I'm, I'm certainly kind of working a lot with uh, works that are not obviously appealing to kind of visual interest. You know, they're kind of post object mm. works or socially social practice and all these sorts of things are kind of renowned for their kind of almost often kind of play on their lack of kind of pro providing anything yep. uh, of interest, of particular interest visually. Although not in the case of Felix Gonzalez Torres, as you mentioned. Um, so I don't think that they have to look any certain kind of way. You know, so that's that's my first kind of point. <laughs> I think that what we're dealing with in this kind of social turn and its legacies is is a particular kind of trajectory, which, uh, and and the way I would tend to read it, and it's not the only way to read it, is in relation to conceptualism and and mm -hmm. the kind of legacies of conceptualism. Uh, therefore, I tend to kind of think in terms of, of the way that kind of critical debates maybe open up a certain way of looking at things and experiencing them. And that's why I'm a bit skeptical, say, around relational aesthetics. You know, I think relational aesthetics, you know, was a, a, a really convenient and helpful way of looking at kind of art that opened up different connections to political developments that were happening mm -hmm. at the same time. But it was not, uh, but before that came along, it, you know, there were all these other ways of looking at the works that he kind of enumerates there, you know, that yeah. kind of were, that kind of were not perhaps, uh, or some of those works perhaps were not completely, it wasn't making sense to everyone exactly how they should see them. So, so it's not, political dimension of art is not always about visuality. It can be. You know, and in the case of Felix Gonzalez Torres, you know, what's so brilliant about his work in terms of aesthetics and, and was so defining about it is that he, he it appeals to people's kind of desire in a kind of very simple way, really simple. You know, do you want to pick up this suite or do you want to take <laughs> this thing here that you can have for free um, that you might think looks nice? And I think that that definitely is a very powerful way in which aesthetics can have politics, you know, and he managed to find a kind of political kind of dimension to that in the way that he proposed it in his work. Most of the other work is kind of non-visual art. 
So there is a whole dimension of of the aesthetics which is non-visual, which I'd say Rancière kind of allows us to yeah. think, think about. You mentioned conceptual art, and I think it's high time we got to the beginning of the book to end yes. with. And there you are in the 1970s, where I think, as I insinuated earlier, you feel most comfortable. And you talk about um, the collective practice of art and language, mm -hmm. um, which I think addresses all of the things that, that, that unravel in the book. There's collectivity, there's the institution, there is, I mean, a quite explicit formulation of political ideas. Mm. So one there were there. Now, with the perspective of all the things that happened after, <laughs> could come back to the 1970s yes. and, and give us an overview of why we are where we are. Okay, great. So that's right. And the 90s, this is, I think this has been a good way to go about it, to go, you know, to kind of think about it in reverse. And because the reason I start with the 1970s is because I'm trying to, to think through the fact that the 1970s was another moment of kind of general crisis, mm -hmm. which was deemed to be economic. You know, it was economic, it was cultural, it was it was operating on many different levels and people weren't quite sure how things were gonna play out. And this was the inception also, of course, of what did play out, which was the sort of neoliberal kind of reformulation of many areas of social life. So it was a kind of hiatus, a kind of a moment where it's possible to sort of think about artists who were kind of trying to come to grips with what they thought were the radical implications mm -hmm. of conceptual art, but were kind of coming to the sense of that maybe they weren't as radical as they'd hoped, you know, and kind of were trying to kind of work through what a more radical op option might be. And the reason I choose the Fox and, and art and language there, really interesting uh practice collective practice associated with conceptual art which isn't normally discussed in relation to mm -hmm. um you know social turn and all these sorts of things so the first thing i wanted to do was to foreground that there, there was this practice that was really interested in social questions quite conflictually engaged in social questions as far as they relate to art and and, and in perceptive ways too um, so there was first that, and I thought that was worth worth raising as a kind of an interesting kind of backstory. I don't claim it's an origin of these sorts mm -hmm. of debates around social practice, because that would be, you know, a bit naive. These questions to do with social agency and art are very, very widespread, and they were widespread in the 1960s and 70s. In in conceptual art, it's, it's useful in art and language in particular, because it really out, opens out in an interesting way um, to uh, their reflections on the institution and also their reflections on the nature of um, critical language in relationship to the institution. Mm. You know, what does it mean to share, to, to kind of debate some of these issues, to unpack them critically? So they allow me a way into that. And, and in particular, that I would, I pick up on something Michael Corris writes about this period. Michael Corris participated in it. He's one of the artists who was involved, but also is now an art historian. But he wrote about that period that it kind of reached a limit to the social is what he describes. And, and the reason he says that is because it, it kind of imploded. Um, <laughs> you know, there were interpersonal issues involved, no doubt, but there were also some kind of interesting sort of political um, questions around which art and language sort of split basically around this journal, the, the Fox. And yet what's, I mean, that happens a lot in art, of course, yeah. and it happens in bands and all sorts of things that kind of are collective. But what's particularly interesting about the evidence they left behind of that split is that they kind of documented it in and through these theoretical debates that they were having. So it's a kind of a particularly intriguing record of a battle that was taking place about the place of art in relation to politics, which I think articulates in quite an interesting way the sorts of tensions that recur in, mm. in later debates in very different context. I don't say they're exactly the same, but what, what an image I might use is, is I would steal from Adorno who in his lectures on metaphysics, he, he writes about problems in philosophy, sometimes being like self-writing toys in that <sighs> they don't actually kind of 
ever go away. They kind of they sort of people have a go at them and then they kind of knock them around a little bit and then they sort of come back. And I think something similar to that happens in debates around the relationship between art and, and social reality and, and politics. Well, but in the course of the last hour, we have, I think, solved most of these problems. So <laughs> if you were planning to write another book, then I'm afraid there's no more need. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. Yeah. Indeed. Um, but I really enjoyed talking to you about it. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you yeah. so much, Kim. Thank you. Social Political Aesthetics, Art Crisis and Neoliberalism by Kim Charnley is published by Bloomsbury. I'm Pierre Dalancet and the editor is Marshall Poe. Thank you for listening and join us next time. Music